OK, so uh, welcome to lecture two of the mini course at the height of same points on orthogonal Schumer varieties and Kolmanski conjecture. Uh, so let me <coughs> briefly recall where we got yesterday, because uh, there is one reduction step that I still want to discuss. And then I'll put on the blackboard the strategy that I want to outline during this week. And uh, there will be several ingredients, and then the rest of the lecture of today, uh, which is one hour and a half, right, today, okay, will be devoted to introducing one of the ingredients, okay? So yesterday, we introduced uh, a certain uh, vector space, uh, CM0. So this is the Q vector space <coughs> of localized constant functions of the Galois group of QCM, the maximal CM extension of, of Q, the union of all CM extensions of Q. The locally constant are central, and they satisfy an extra assumption. I don't want to, doesn't really matter the definition that we, we gave, OK? And then <coughs> uh, Colmes explained us that you had a function from C M0, in fact, to C, OK? Where you take any such function uh, gamma that you write as a sum of Artin characters up to C linear, um, as a C linear combination of Artin characters. That's because our function is central. And to that, you associate uh, uh, Z gamma, which is defined as minus the sum over all the Artin characters appearing in this decomposition. With the, so you take a scalar multiple of something that you cook up from eta, and which is simply, let me make, take the sign, correct the log derivative of the Artin character eta. And the extra assumption that we have in the definition of CM0 guarantees that this not, does not vanish, plus log of the Artin conductor of eta divided by 2. So maybe I can write things slightly more centered. OK. <clears throat> and then we also saw that you can cook up from E a CM field and phi a CM type for E to such a pair, you can construct a function A naught E phi belonging to CM0. OK. And uh, actually, there is a proposition of Colmes that there exists a unique linear map height from CM0 to C such that for every pair of a CM field and CM type as before, as below, if you compose height, if you apply height to the function A naught E phi that we constructed yesterday, and I don't want to recall the definition, this is the faulting height of E phi. <clears throat> Remember, this is simply the faulting site of any abelian variety having full action of the ring of integers of E and CM type phi. OK? And then we can rephrase the conjecture. by saying that, in fact, z 
is equal to height. OK, <coughs> good. So as I, s I said, I need a one more reduction step. So as I explained yesterday, if you consider C E uh, CM field and you consider the set of all CM types, Remember, these are subsets of the possible embeddings of E into C, such that the subset, this John union, its image under complex conjugation, gives the whole possible homomorphisms. So these are all the phi. So this has an action of G, which remember was the Galois group of this maximal CM extension of Q, right? Simply for every embedding of E into C, you compose these factors through QCM and you compose with automorphism of QCM, okay? And you get another embedding and in this way, this, uh, you get an action also on the subsets of home EC. So we can view it's a finite set plus a continuous action of my Gala group G. And then you know uh, there is a very well known. Uh, theorem of Grothendieck that tells you that uh, there is a so that's the formulation of <coughs> Galois theory. There is a, an anti equivalence between finite. et al. Q algebras and uh, finite sets with action with continuous of the Gala group of Q bar over Q. Well, here we have one, certainly. And that corresponds then via this equivalence to some et al Q algebras, Q algebra that I call E sharp, and that is known under the name of uh, total or complete reflex algebra. Okay, and actually the correspondence is quite simple because if you have an et al Q algebra, you simply consider all Q bar points, all homomorphisms as Q algebras from A to Q bar. That gives a finite set because you start with a finite algebra, and it has an action of uh, a continuous action of uh, gal Q bar over Q. Okay, so this E sharp is an et al Q algebra, so it's a product of uh, finitely many field extensions of Q, because separable, uh, that's what it means, a separable extension of uh, Q is always of that type, you are in characteristic zero, and it's simply characterized by the fact that its Q bar points is given by all possible C types compatibly with the action of the Galois group, okay? Yes? So here you have an action of uh, 
as UCM over U. Yes. And then you need an action of total Q bar over Q. Yes. No, I mean, so you certainly have a, a projection to G, OK? So that simply means that the fields that appear here will split completely over QCM, OK? <clears throat> so in particular, that's a good point. So the fact that uh, the action of gal Q bar over Q on CME factors via QCM implies that, in fact, my E sharp is the product of CM fields. OK? And uh, <coughs> usually, one is more adjusted to, if one consider uh, CM theory, uh, to the concept of the reflex field. And the reflex field is simply the composite of the CM fields appearing in that decomposition, OK? So you know, I'm simply refining this, uh, uh, the notion of CM, CM field, the uh, reflex field, by separating these different contributions, OK? And uh, I also define, uh, so recall, that we have fixed an embedding that they call the uh, zero. And then I also define phi sharp to be uh, the subset of home E sharp uh, Q bar, which as I said, we said is CM of E. So I take also as phi sharp <coughs> uh, simply all, all uh, Q bar points of E sharp that corresponds to CME defined by those elements corresponding to elements phi in CM of E such that Iota zero belongs to phi. OK? So starting from my Galois set of CM types, I hooked up an algebra, which is a product of CM fields, and some of the homomorphism from E sharp to Q, Q bar. In fact, half of them, OK? Because by the definition of same type, you know that either yota 0 or its complex conjugate lies in that, right? So we can exactly get half. And then one can prove that E sharp is the product of the same fields. Then <coughs> if this is a product of the same fields, this homomorphism to Q bar will be the disjoint union of all possible embeddings of these same fields inside Q bar. Also, this phi sharp will decompose according to this disjoint union, and it will define a same type for each of the same fields appearing in this decomposition. So let me write it. So one can prove that if my E sharp is the product of certain EI, where Q inside EI uh, are CM fields, then my phi, then my home E sharp Q bar is the disjoint union over I of all possible homomorphisms from E 
or I, could, I can say Q bar or C, doesn't matter, of my EI C, right? Because any map from E sharp to QP bar must factor through one of those EI, okay? And then my phi sharp that I selected over there, okay, as a subset of those homomorphisms, also decomposes as phi i sharp, and in fact, for each i, phi i sharp is same type for e i. Okay? And now, uh, by <coughs> Extending the definition of my A0 and my Z and so on from the case of one pair E phi, where E is a field, to the case where you have a product of fields which are CM and for a, a same type, which is a union of same types, you also get that you can define the faulting height of uh, an abelian variety which has CM by the ring of integers of E sharp, by which I mean it has CM by the product of all those ring of integers, and there's CM given by this phi sharp, okay? And similarly, you get Okay, so I'm simply generalizing the definition that I gave yesterday for the case of one CM field with one CM type to the case of a product of CM fields and the choice of a CM type for any of the fields. Okay? So in particular, your, here your abelian variety will be the product of many abelian varieties, each of which have full CM by the ring of integers of EI and CM type phi I sharp. And so the faulting height will be the sum of the faulting heights of the various components. Okay, so that's the extension that I'm talking about. Okay. And now I want to add uh, one extra thing over there. Let's see if I manage not to erase, not to hide the full blackboard, and then there is a simple lemma that inside my uh, Q vector space CM0, if you sum up up to average over the degree all possible A0 E phi, where the sum is over all possible CM types of E, this is equal to the function A0 for this CM algebra and this CM type. Okay? I'm not going into the proof of this, uh, which is purely purely algebra, and entering the definition of the of reflex pairs, proving that uh, abelian varieties with CM, two abelian varieties with CM given by reflex pairs have the same height, and then and the same then the same function in fact, and then you can sort of prove that that equality. Yes. So the reflex Sorry. Yes. Yes, yes. So for each of them, the reflex field is E. The only point is that the, the, the reflex uh, 
the associated uh, sim type changes is not phi. Right. So you, ca you can, uh, so each AI is determined by an orbit for the Galois group on the, on the CM types of E. Okay? Uh, so that singles out an orbit of one CM type. And then E with an element on, in this specific orbit, so a CM type, which is an element in the orbit of CME defining EI, and EI and phi I sharp are left reflex pairs. No, no, no. So th there are more elements. So there are actually the correspondence is, is not one to one. So orbits are not consist of one element. No. So if you go back. I think if you take EI and phi I sharp and you do the reverse construction, you get back um, as a total reflex algebra, many copies of E, so it's the same field, but the associated phi I sharp sharp is a disjoint union of all elements in the orbit of CME defining, defining EI. So that's, I think, the correspondence, if you want to go back. OK? Yes, the degree of E and E sharp are different, yes. Yes, yes, they are different, definitely. This is much, much larger. Yes. So if you go back, you always have E, but it appears many times. And that's because you want to spread out the same types according to this orbit that is not necessarily consisting of one element. Okay? Yes, thanks. Okay, so finally, uh, the Colmes conjecture. becomes the following. So if you apply the function height that I've defined there on the left-hand side, you get the sum over all uh, the, the height, the faulting height of E phi over all phi. This is equal, since my function height is linear, to height of A0 E sharp phi sharp, OK? But this is the faulting height of an abelian variety with full CM by E sharp and CM type phi sharp. So the left hand side of, uh, so the faulting side that I want to compute will simply be the height, sorry, the faulting height of E sharp phi sharp. Then let me multiply this by the degree of the field, so that I get simply the sum of the faulting height of E phi, okay? And that, according to my, uh, uh, my <coughs> conjecture, should be, if I divide also by 2 to the d, equal to minus 1 half of L prime chi is 0, while the car character chi defines the extension F inside E. F is a total real field. OK, and that's the reduction step that I was alluding to. And the formula that I want to prove. So I got rid of the sum of the faulting side of E phi by 
putting everything together in the faulting site of one abelian variety with full CM by the ring of integers of E sharp in the sense that I mentioned before. So let me put on the blackboard the strategy now to prove the, the fo this formula. So this is the final formula that we will focus on. And the strategy is the following. One, first of all, we construct a certain scheme, I should say a certain stack, over the ring of integers of OE, okay, uh, which is finite and it's y0 is also normal. So it's simply the disjoint union of spec of ring of integers of number fields, okay? Plus some A sharp over y0, which is an abelian scheme with action of O e sharp that using the decomposition that we had before this is the product of OEI. And CM type phi sharp. So my Y0 will simply be generically a zero dimensional Shimura variety, okay? Classifying essentially those abelian varieties with the full CM by OE sharp it has some extra structure, okay? And that, those will admit uh, an integral model, okay? What this gives, as explained yesterday, a metrized line bundle, omega A sharp hat, so we take the Hodge bundle, the, the invariant differentials of A sharp, and you take the top exterior power, plus some metric at infinity coming from uh, the definition that I gave yesterday with the integrals, okay? Whose degree, so the degree divided by the degree of my Y0 that maybe does not consist simply of one component, okay, will be the faulting site that we want. Okay? So that's one thing. And that will be defined, I think, on Thursday. Two. For every L in E uh, suitable lattice, and the suitable lattice will also be clarified on, on uh, uh, Wednesday. I will define an, a Shimura variety, an integral model M, which will depend on the lattice, actually, over spec Z of a uh, Shimura variety, ML. Here actually the level will be fixed, so we'll not consider all possible varying levels as uh, 
was uh, defined yesterday, plus a metrized line bundle omega hat on ML. That's a sort of a general definition, has nothing to do with the, our CM cycle. But then we will define also a finite cover and a map to my ML. Okay? Such that there exists a finite set of very bad times the L, which will depend on my lattice L. So all this construction of YL and L will all depend on the lattice, such that if we pull back my the, the metrics line bundle that I want to, whose degree I want to compute to YL, and if you pull back the omega hat to YL, well, they are almost the same except at primes in the L. So I can compare these two metrized line bundles except at finitely many primes. Okay? Finally, now I can use uh, moreover, uh, we can express by theory of uh, Borchert and Brunier omega hat as a combination or some power, express some powers of omega hat as a combination of arithmetic Higner divisors Okay, well the index set has to be made a little bit more precise. I will be more careful tomorrow when I will introduce them. And the Brunier Kudla Yang conjecture provides a formula for the arithmetic intersection of this z hat of m and yl. OK? So these two arithmetic degrees then will be the same, except for these uh, finitely many bad primes. And they will be essentially what I want to compute. On the other hand, the right hand side can be expressed as a combination of specific arithmetic Higner divisors. If I can compute the arithmetic intersection between these arithmetic Higner divisors and my YL with very precise numbers, and that's the conjecture of Brunier, Kula, Yang, I, then I can take the combination and get the computation of the expected arithmetic degree. Okay? And the last ingredient, so we prove, I'll just put it here, we prove BKY except at primes up to 
pure linear combination of log of primes belonging to this very bad set of primes. So what's the final outcome? The final outcome is that we can prove Colmes conjecture up to Q linear combination of log of primes P belonging to that finite set DL that depends on the lattice L. But now I have the freedom to change L, right? And since log of primes are Q linearly independent, for every bad prime that I have for the choice of the first L, I can find another L for which this bad prime is good. And then I remove the indeterminacy at that log P. And so on and so on. This way, by varying the lattice L, I can get rid of all the indeterminacy and get Colmes conjecture. OK? And uh, so that's what I meant yesterday by saying that we proved sufficiently many cases of the grunier coudalien conjecture in the sense that we did not prove the full conjecture because there is this indeterminacy here. OK? But what we have is uh, enough. Of course, I'm behind schedule. So since, let me just write here, since I can arrange uh, a choice of L's such that the intersection of all these L is the empty set, it's not the same type, <laughs> I get the averaged. Mess. So that's the brief sketch, the general outline. Okay? So today I want to discuss number two, the introduction of these Shimura varieties using the work that uh, uh, we saw yesterday about Shimura varieties. Uh, then on Wednesday I will have one hour, I will talk about those arithmetic Igner divisors. Then on Thursday I have again one hour and a half, right? And that will be enough to discuss the same cycle and how the total reflex algebra appears, how you can embed everything inside. Uh, yes? So the prime two can also be removed. Can be removed as well, yes. Yes, that actually was the <coughs> our main concern for a long time. But then thanks to work of uh, Madapusi Pera and uh, Van Sukim, uh, we actually we could find also a good, uh, good models also at prime two, and along the same strategy, remove also the prime p equal two, so we really get the full average mass conjecture, not up to q log two. Yes. <coughs> and then on Friday we'll put everything together, and I will try to discuss the last part of the blackboard. Okay. OK, so I hope even if I did not define all those objects, at least I hope that the picture and the general strategy and where the things that we will do next days fit is clear. OK, so the rest of today's lecture, hoping that I managed to finish, is about uh, Shimura varieties. of orthogonal and in fact I will need G spin type. So those ML ML above. Okay? So as we saw yesterday, uh, orthogonal groups uh, it was on the list of possible Hermitian symmetric uh, domains, 
okay? And uh, I want to sort of elaborate a little bit this ex specific example that uh, yesterday we just simply saw as one of the possible examples without entering really the details. So the starting point is uh, a Q vector space and a quadratic form of signature N2. That was exactly the signature that was appearing uh, yesterday in uh, Burgas' uh, list. And actually, we also have the bilinear form quadratic form and this is the bilinear form associated <clears throat> and actually I really want to uh, work at this level which is a, a cover of the orthogonal group because we will need a billion varieties, which will not live on uh, orthogonal type two varieties, but only on this refinement. And for that, I need to introduce the group G spin. Okay? So now the, the goal is to define G spin of EQ. And as I said, this will sit, will sit in an exact sequence of this type. So it's not far from being uh, the orthogonal group. This is the central torus appearing. And then define a, 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 a symmetric you know, Hermitian. symmetric domain D, which will be the same for G spin and for SO, okay? So the symmetric space does not see the fact that I pass to, see this, to this central extension of SO. And then together with this group that I will simply denote G and the symmetric space domain D, I will do what Burgos explained us yesterday and define uh, Shimura variety, okay? Okay, so how is, defined, how is the group G spin defined? So first of all, we, define, we need the Clifford algebra. Okay, so we let C, let me simply write CV from now on, the quadratic form is fixed once and for all. Let CV be the Clifford algebra associated to V, so it's contained, so uh, it's, uh, uh, it satisfies the following universal property. So CV uh, is a Q-algebra. It contains the vector space V that we started with as a Q-vector space, okay? And it is the Q algebra which is universal for the following property. So if you have a, a, a Q algebra R and uh, J is a Q linear map such that for every V in V, if you take uh, the image of little V 
and you multiply by itself, this is simply Q of V. So Q of V is a scalar in Q. And since R is a Q algebra, I can view it inside R. Okay. Then there exists a unique Q algebra homomorphism from CV to R such that this is. OK? So I want to make multiplication by two elements in my algebra being equal to my quadratic form. And in fact, it's not very difficult to, if you want this universal property, to define C of V. Well, if you have a vector, yes. Commutative. So it's V is a subvector space of CV. It also admits a map, Q linear map to R. There is a Q algebra homomorphism here, and you want that if you compose, you get a map J. This map J. Yes, for every V in V, I demand that this is true. Yes. So what can you do? If you have a vector space, how do you define, how do you make a vector space in, into a Q algebra? Not necessarily commutative. This Clifford algebra will be highly non-commutative, OK? So how do you make a, an algebra out of a vector space? Well, you take the tensor algebra, for example, OK? That's the most canonical way to do it. And then you simply force the relation that we want. So we divide out by the two-sided ideal generated by V tensor V, because this tensor is now the product in the tensor algebra, right, minus Q of V. Well, little v varies in capital V. This satisfies the universal property that you want, basically by definition. OK? In fact, one remark is that uh, since the two-sided ideal I'm modding out is generated by even tensors, so this is a tensor of degree 2, this is a tensor of degree 0, the, the fact that you can divide the tensors it into even and odd is preserved by taking the quotient. So using uh, even and odd tensors, we get a decomposition of my Clifford algebra into an even part and into an odd part. This is the even Clifford algebra. So it's a subalgebra of CV. C minus V is not a subalgebra because if you multiply two odd tensors, you get an even one, but it is a two sided ideal. It's a two sided ideal for C plus V of odd.
OK. Mind. The dimension of C of V is 2 to the n plus 2, where n is our uh, dimension of the vector, I mean, n plus 2 is the dimension of our vector space V. OK? This will be important because uh, we will see that on our Shimura variety, m of l, we will construct an abelian variety starting from our Clifford algebra. This Clifford algebra will be essentially the homology of our abelian variety, which is called uh, the Kuga-Satake abelian variety, okay? that exists only on the Shimura variety defined by Gspin and not on the orthogonal quotient. That's why we prefer this group, even if we have to go through the complications of defining the Clifford algebra. But you also see that the dimension of this abelian variety grows exponentially in two. Okay? So it's difficult to, to control. Okay, so we define the Clifford algebra, we define the even Clifford algebra. We still we are still not there with the definition of G spin. Maybe just to uh, warm up a bit with these concepts, let's compute, uh, well, maybe let's define first G spin, and then let's may maybe uh, try to compute one example, the easiest one when n is equal to zero, and see what we get, okay? Okay, then for every Q algebra R, I define G spin of V, the R valued points, simply as the element in the Clifford algebra, even Clifford algebra, over R. So this becomes an R, a, a non commutative R algebra. I take its invertible elements, two-sided invertible elements, okay? And I demand the following. So we said that inside <coughs> the Clifford algebra, in fact, inside the odd part of the Clifford algebra, we have our vector space V, okay? So I can conjugate my vector space V by, by my invertible element, okay? I get another Q vector subspace of CV tensor R, and I demand that in fact this is contained, sorry, I should take uh, V tensor QR. I demand that this is contained in V So I take all those units, which when, you conjug when I conjugate, preserve the image of V via this embedding. OK? So you see now that this admits, on the one hand, so it's a subgroup of C plus V uh, tensor Q R star, so it admits a map to GL of C plus V. That's one uh, representation that will be interesting, interesting for our group. Okay, and the claim is that uh, this functor that I defined uh, describing the R value points is really an algebraic group, okay, that I don't want to enter into. So this uh, algebraic group admits it's a subgroup of uh, the automorphous group of C plus V and even, in fact, of C of V, <coughs> where here the embedding is simply given by uh, left multiplication. So if I have an invertible element, some C 
c plus v tensor r star, I can multiply on the left c v tensor r, and that defines an automorphism. So as simple as that. On the other hand, you see that since the conjugation preserves v, I also have a map to the automorphism group of v. Right? And in fact, it's not difficult to see that <coughs> this conjugation preserves the quadratic form on V. So, and in fact, it's even, it even maps to SO of V of R. So the fact that it, it preserves, it gives determinant one elements I don't want to get into, but in fact it preserves the quadratic form is not, it's not really difficult to, to see. Because how do you define a quadratic form of V using this embedding? Well, it's just an element, time itself, inside C of V. So if you conjugate, and you, so if you have x little v, x minus 1, you multiply by itself, you get the Q of it. x minus 1, x, erase. And the result that comes out is the Q of the original V you started with. So it's a simple computation, the fact that it preserves a uh, quadratic form. do this example. In fact, if V lies in V tensor QR, Q of V is equal V times V, as we said. And Q of X V X minus 1 is X V X minus 1 times X V X minus 1, right? So it's x q of v x minus 1. But the scalar are in the center of my algebra. So it's equal to q of v. So you see that this action by conjugation preserve the quadratic form. Right? Now, as I said, uh, the scalars, the scalar, so those coming from, from the scalar elements coming from R act trivially on V, okay? So they map to the identity in S O V R, okay? So GM is contained in G spin V R. So this is simply the scalar, the scalars. Uh, map trivially to S O V. And then we get the exact sequence that I've uh, mentioned before. And that maybe I can put. Uh, on the blackboard once more. OK, so that should explain, starting from the Clifford algebra, the structure of my group G spin. Example, let's see if you can compute it. Suppose n equal to 0, OK? Then V 
can be written as QE1 plus QE2, where QE1 is equal to 1 is a negative integer, and QE2 is equal to A2 is also a negative integer. So what is our even Clifford algebra? Well, I, take, I have to take uh, the tensors, OK? So I'll have simply the zero tensors, so that's uh, Q, OK? And then I have uh, <coughs> uh, V tensor V, where uh, E1 times E1 appears. But in the quotient, this is simply Q of E1. Then I have E2 tensor E2 appearing, but that's equal to Q E2. So it's already in Q. So the only terms that survives also for other even tensors are the mixed terms where I multiply E1 and E2. This is a Q vector space. Well, but I said this is an algebra. We want to compute the, alge the algebra structure, OK? So Q are simply the scalars, give the structure of a Q algebra on C plus V. So we simply need to know what's x squared, right? Okay, so let's try to compute it. So we'll need also another integer, which is the value of the quadratic form of the bilinear form in E1, E2. Remember, this is Q E1 plus E2 minus Q E1 minus Q E2. And then we can compute x squared. So that's e1 times e2 times e1 times e2. And this can be computed as minus e1 squared e2 squared. So I simply exchange the two by using uh, my quadratic form and my bilinear form. So you should simply here write, so this is a scalar, but it's also E1 plus E2 times E1 plus E2. So you have the terms, so you, will, you have an expression in terms of rational numbers of E1 times E2 plus E2 times E1. So you get the commutation relation between E1 times E2 and E2 times E1. That's how you, you use this to, to fit, it, fit, this, fit this in. Hence, it is isomorphic simply to Q of x modulo x squared minus dx plus a1, a2. And uh, the fact that Q is non-degenerate form, so it has really signature 2, tells us that in fact this is an imaginary quadratic field extension of Q. OK? And what is G spin? Well, in this case, it's simply the units of C plus V star, the conjugation requirement is automatically satisfied because we are in such a low dimension, okay? And uh, maybe I can write this 
And this, if I denote this uh, field K, so this is K tensor over QR star, and this is simply a way, and there's a way to denote this, it's the value restriction of GM evaluated on R. So my group G is a torus. It's a rank two torus. Okay? In fact, over R, my GR, well, in this case, uh, all R vector spaces with a quadratic form, which is negative definite, are all the same. And what you get, it's simply the value restriction from C to R of GM, which is usually denoted as S, and it's the lean torus that yesterday was floating around but never appeared explicitly, it's exactly obtained in this way. Okay. So we have our reductive group, G, defined in general. In this case, it's a torus. And to define a Shimura variety, we need uh, an Hermitian symmetric domain for this group. for G and in fact also for SOV, nothing, nothing changes. So yesterday we saw that it can be defined simply by taking the quotient of the real points of my group G by uh, a maximal compact subgroup. And there was a way to induce uh, in good situations like this a complex structure. In fact, in our case, we have uh, very explicit incarnations of this uh, symmetric domain that give both the real analytic structure and the complex structure, okay? So we have several incarnations. So incarnation as a, a real manifold. Let's simply take uh, dr to be the Grossmannian of negative definite planes in the real vector space associated to V. There's an action of G on that, clearly, okay, since G and in fact SO acts on V, right? And then if you choose one of those, negative definite plane, as a base point, you'll see that this dr, at least if n is bigger or equal to 1, this dr is isomorphic to the quotient of the real points of G modulo the stabilizer, which is a maximal compact subgroup, which is SO of the plane and SO of the complement. Actually, Maybe the orthogonal group, and then you have a, well, okay. a determinant condition on the product. Okay? So that's the first incarnation of this uh, uh, homogeneous space. And as I said, if you take a base point in this Grossman, you get the expression that we saw yesterday. So incarnation as complex. Uh, 
as a complex yeah, manifold. Here, uh, so I simply take uh, uh, the elements in the complexified vector space, which are non-trivial, and with the property that the quadratic form evaluated on Z is zero, so you get a nice quadric, okay? And the bilinear form on Z, Z bar is negative definite, and well, I mod out by the scalars acting on Z, so this is really a subspace of the projectivized a space associated to the sorry to to V. Okay, so you take the zeros of the quadric defined by Q, and then uh, there is a, uh, exactly as for the Poincaré upper or lower space where you have this condition on the imaginary part being positive or negative, you should really see this as the as the analog of that. Okay. <clears throat> and how do you go from one to the other? got here or oriented. So also choose uh, an orientation on these negative definite planes, as you will see in a second. So uh, how to go from one to two and vice versa. So if I have H inside V of R negative definite plane and I take uh, an ortho normal basis for my plane the orientation is simply a choice of E1 before E2 or uh, or vice versa and yeah so that's uh, what I mean by, by the orientation. Then I associate the representative of a Z in uh, D of C, where Z is simply E1 plus I, E2. And you see, we'll see that Q of Z, uh, thanks to this requirement, is zero, and that uh, Z, Z bar is uh, negative. So it satisfies the, exactly this, this condition. And vice versa, given a Z that you can express as a real part plus imaginary part, you take the plane inside V of R spanned by the real part of this line defined by Z and the imaginary part, and you see that this, this will define an oriented negative definite plane. Okay. And here, actually, I want to add a third incarnation, even if uh, Burgos carefully avoided this yesterday, but I will need at some point, because uh, actually I will not need that it's equivalent to one and two, but at least that it, uh, it's an extra thing that you get from, uh, so maybe I'll, I'll add it there, from uh, one note. that given an H in VR in uh, DR, we get an embedding of <coughs> G-spin of this negative definite plane to G-spin of 
uh, VR, which is simply uh, the group G over the reals. And we said that this is simply the Deline torus. And it's possible to define also Shimura varieties as conjugacy classes of maps from the Lean torus to group G satisfying certain conditions. I won't need that, but at least I want to give you the fact that you naturally have a map associated to the first interpretation as a real manifold uh, from the Deline torus to the group G, G spin over the reals. Okay. Uh, what happens in our baby case example for n equal to zero? Uh, well, one can in fact prove that the complex dimension of our, uh, for example, complex incarnation of our immediate symmetric space is n. The same n as appeared in the dimension of v, which was n plus 2, or in the signature of v, which was n2. Okay? Recall vq of signature n2. So it's the same n. So in particular, for n equal to 0, there's simply two points, simply because in our case, V tensor R is already a negative definite plane. And the only thing that you have to do is to choose one of the two possible orientations. So in our baby case, just get two points. OK? So not very interesting. Uh, I think only for n equals 0. Has two components. No, you have two components, but sorry, you have two components, but the real points of G act transitively and switches the two, except for n equal to zero. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. OK, so now we have our group G. We have our symmetric space D. And we can define a Shimura variety. OK. Definition of Shimura variety, varieties. So <clears throat> since I will need it later, let me slightly generalize what uh, we saw yesterday and give an ad the Adelic definition, but then I will immediately translate also into the language that we saw yesterday. So we have our group G. We have our symmetric space as before. I also choose uh, a compact open open subgroup of the finite adelic points of G. So that's the finite adeles. I take uh, uh, the values, the points in the finite adeles over Q of G. And I take a compact open subgroup. And then I define m of k to be, I take the product of my Hermitian symmetric space times my adelic points. I mod out by k acting simply on the right on the adelic points. Then I mod, I mod out also by the q points of g, which act both on d 
and the onderic points on the left. Does it have anything to do with what we saw yesterday? And the answer is yes. And let me spell it out. So we see that this bizarre looking thing where you also have adelic points indeed has a natural complex structure. Because this is the disjoint union of connected components. And the connected components are simply numbered by this finite quotient. And this uh, gamma G, it's simply the Q valued points of G intersected with, uh, does it really matter, by the conjugate of my group kappa is an arithmetic subgroup. So set theoretically, you have such a decomposition. And actually, we will use this set theoretic description to induce a complex structure on MK. So you see that yesterday, uh, Burgos defined uh, Ashimura variety as a tower of those objects where the arithmetic group is varying. Okay. Here I will, when I talk about Shimura variety, I'm really assuming that the level K is fixed. And we will work with one level. And the ML that appears here, there, you see, depending on a lattice, and I will now describe it, and that probably will be the last thing that I will do. For today, uh, we provide such a level K, and then ML with the Shimura variety of fixed level. OK, so let me uh, simply finish for today with the definition of ML. Page seven, eight. OK. So good compact open subgroups. So how do we find good subgroups for which, for example, we can define an integral model? OK. And so we proceed as follows. So let L inside V be a lattice such that Q restricted to L is uh, maps L to Z. So Q is integrally defined on L. And then we define to this, we define <coughs> KL to be the intersection of the adelic points. Remember that the adelic points <coughs> live inside the Clifford algebra tensor, the units of the, Clifford, the even Clifford algebra tensor with adelic points. Okay. Inside this, we also have, so you see the construction that I made uh, of the Clifford algebra associated to a Q vector space, so goes through in the same way for our lattice L, right? I can take the symmetric powers of L, mod out by the two-sided ideal V tensor V equal to Q of V. The only thing that I have to make sure is that this Q of V is in Z, if I want to get a Z algebra, okay? So from this, I can cook up CL, the Clifford algebra, the Z Clifford algebra of L and Q restricted to L. Inside, I have a C plus of L, which is a Z algebra. OK. And now I can complete this Z algebra 
okay, with respect to ideals of Z, okay, so it's the complete or it's the product of the completion for every P of this algebra, and I can take. Uh, the units that we live in here, and I can take an intersection. So these are all the elements that arise as units of this Z hat algebra here. That's what it is. And then the notation is simply that ML is my M K of L for L such a lattice. Okay, and maybe last remark for n uh, bigger equal to 1, uh, this complex, so we know by Billy Burrell that it's a complex variety over C. is defined over Q. So the field the number field where it's defined, we saw yesterday that it exists, and it's a number field, is in this case for this specific choice of uh, group is Q. Okay? For n equal to zero, one second, for n equal to zero, well, we saw that the, the group G spin, it's simply the value restriction from a quadratic imaginary field, and then if you construct for n equal to zero the associated uh, Shimura variety, the reflex field, so called, it is the field where the Shimura variety is defined following the same lines, is exactly this quadratic imaginary field. That's the difference between n equals 0 and b or equal to 1. Question? Could you recall what the plus of L hat means? So z plus L hat, it's simply the inverse limit over all possible integers of C plus L. So it's the completion as a Z module, OK? So as a cofinal system, you just take the ideals generated by elements in Z. OK, I'll stop here. So what remains to be done, and actually I had hoped to do it today, but of course, Actually, is finished, is to tell you, to explain you how the fact that our group G spin admits two very natural morphisms, one to SOV, the other to the automorphisms of the group of automorphisms GL of CV, induces extra structure on our Shimura variety. Okay? So I will explain this tomorrow, and I will use this tomorrow to define Higner divisors and hopefully also their integral models, OK? One second point that I will uh, uh, actually discuss again tomorrow is that uh, these Shimura varieties do not have, in general, our modular interpretation except for low dimensional n. I will repeat this tomorrow. So uh, that's why they have not been studied uh, so much in terms of arithmetic intersection theory, because if you do not have a variety which has a very natural modular interpretation, it's difficult to define models, right? For GL2, you have modular curves, and you can make sense of a modular curve as a classifying space of elliptic curves over Q, over P, in characteristic P, whatever, okay? This gives you immediately a way to define models. This is not at all the case. So the definition here is purely complex analytic by hermetic domains, and we have to struggle to define integral models. 
Okay? So that's the drawback of working with these kind of varieties. But I also hope to convince you that they have a, such a rich structure of Igner divisors, CM points, and so on and so on, that even if we have this difficulty of defining integral models, they are still very interesting objects to study. Okay? But this is for tomorrow. Thanks.